brief introduction about myself. Um, my name is Sean. Um, I do a number of different things. These are some of the things that I've done this year. Um, I am an entrepreneur. Uh, I have my own little, small, little startup company. It's called SD Works. Um, what we do is basically what I'm going to talk about today, which is uh, basically microprocessors, and specifically open source microprocessors. Um, uh, we, our business model is basically services, so we give away the microprocessor code, uh, tool chains and stuff like that, but we provide training and consulting and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I'm also an, I was also an academic this year at uh, UCSI University, which is a uh, private university located in a suburb outside of Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Um, I was also a research fellow to TMRND. Um, that's a research institute owned by the uh, National Telco, uh, Telecom Malaysia. Um, I'm also currently a law student uh, at University of Malaya, which is uh, like the oldest law school in Malaysia. And if you haven't figured it out, I'm from Malaysia, um, which is like a really, really nice little warm country where it's 30 degrees all year round. Yeah, so this temperature here is a little cold for me, but um, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll try to make do. So yeah, um, well, uh, on to the talk, yeah. So that's the outline. I've basically broken it up into just three parts. Um, the first part is gonna be basically uh, basic uh, definitions and introductions and stuff like that. I assume most of you probably already know the stuff I'm gonna talk about in the first part. Um, but I mean, just bear with me. Okay, so it's like uh, introductions in case anyone here is not familiar with the concepts of microprocessors. Um, the second part will be on my journey, which is basically, you see a whole bunch of acronyms there, short words. Um, those are the bunch of processes that, have, that I've actually designed uh, in the past, uh, different processes for different reasons. I'll talk a little bit about that. And then finally, I'll talk about how to actually design microprocessors uh, and how you can actually do it on your own and hopefully within a week, okay? going from concept to implementation within uh, seven days. All right. So the first question is, um, what's an open source microprocessor? Um, what does it actually mean? What, why do I mention open source microprocessors specifically? Because um, that's what I do. Uh, all my microprocessors are all open source, so you can actually download them if you want to. But yeah, so uh, what does it mean specifically? What, is open source, uh, what does open source microprocessors mean? There are two main words there. The first one, the easy one, is what's a microprocessor? I assume that everyone here knows what a microprocessor is, but in case you don't, uh, it's essentially the brain of every modern computing platform, from servers, uh, desktop PCs, laptops, down to even your smartphones, uh, iPads, iPho uh, uh, iPods, even your microwave oven uh, and air conditioning, if you have them. Uh, they have microprocessors in them. So uh, they're the basic of all modern uh, computing devices, um, all modern consumer electronics. Uh, the job of a microprocessor is very simple. Uh, it takes a bunch of instructions, which is a program that somebody writes, uh, uh, and it uses it, it runs it on basically a bunch of input. So it takes input from somewhere, it runs it, uh, runs, runs it through the process, and then it spits out a bunch of output. So that's basically it. Uh, not, it doesn't sound like it's very smart, uh, it actually isn't, uh, but yeah, it's the heart of and the brains of all our modern uh, computing devices. Now the next word in there is actually open source. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about open source software. I assume, again, most people here know what open source is, um, but essentially, uh, essentially it means that besides being able to obtain copies of the software, uh, the user can also obtain uh, the source code, which is basically the guts of the software. And the user is then free to do whatever they want with the source code. So they can see it if they want to, uh, they can take it apart, they can add stuff in there. Uh, it's totally up to them. Yep. So they have the freedom to do whatever they want with uh, the source code uh, and also the software. Now, that's uh, rather old school. I, I mean, open source software has been around for quite a while. Now, in recent years, uh, there's been a movement, which is basically an open source hardware movement, um, which is basically bringing the concepts of open source sof software into the realm of hardware. So instead of just making the source code of software available, 
We also make uh, the designs for the hardware. The so you buy a physical object or you get a physical object, uh, but you also can get access to the actual designs for the object. Uh, one of the most popular things in recent years is the Arduino platform, uh, and it's, uh, it, you can get the schematics, you can download it, you can make your own copy of the Arduino, stuff like that. So it's totally up to you. Again, the same principle applies. You can add to it, you can take stuff away, you can modify it. It's totally up to you. Yeah. So what does this mean when, when, I, when I talk about open source microprocessors specifically? So open source microprocessors isn't just about the hardware, it's not just about the software, it's actually a bit of both. Um, in order for, for us to release an open, release an open source microprocessor, uh, you, also, you would not just have to release, uh, the basic, basic thing of course would, would be to actually release the, the, the circuit design for the processor. That's the very basic uh, thing that you've got to release. Sometimes uh, we also release uh, schematics of the system if the processor is integrated into any system. And of course, uh, sometimes PCB layouts are also given. But the very least, uh, the circuit design for the processor itself uh, is available. So anyone who wants to modify the processor, add features to the processor, um, take stuff away, uh, study it, uh, it's totally possible with open source microprocessors. But besides that, uh, we've also got to release uh, certain software as well. At the very least, there should be uh, some libraries that are provided uh, to ensure that the process actually uh, can be used by the end user. Uh, but uh, sometimes there may be drivers for specific uh, hardware functionality that is needed. Uh, but be, besides that, uh, there may be applications as well, example applications. But essentially, it's that, okay? So we've got open source, uh, the philo philosophy of open source being applied to actually uh, microprocessor design. So we release both the hardware as well as the software. So at this point, some people usually ask me, I usually fa face two questions. Uh, the first question is usually, why are you working in microprocessors? Uh, the reason is because the, the common argument is that uh, Processors today are a commodity. There are so many on the market, you can just pick one off the shelf. Um, so why would anybody want to build their own microprocessor? Why would anybody want to you know, uh, have their own custom uh, version? Um, the way I see it, my answer is usually this. Um, commodity microprocessors are great if your problems are common problems. Uh, sometimes we face co problems that are not so common, in which case uh, the best solution may actually be a custom uh, microprocessor or specialized microprocessor to do certain things. Yeah, so that's one of the, uh, one of the questions I usually face. Um, the other question that I usually get is, uh, why, are you doing, uh, why are you designing uh, microprocessors? Don't you have anything else better to do with your life? Uh, better, thing, better things to do with your life, right? Um, of course, there are a lot of things we can do with our lives, but there's a reason for this. Um, so I'm gonna take you through a short story, essentially my journey. Um, from where I came from, uh, where I came from, and how I ended up doing open source microprocessors today. So, with every good story, we shall start at the beginning. So, um, I basically started with software programming. I started programming in 1989, and I guess most of you here are old enough to know that in 1989, computers weren't that cheap. Right, they're quite expensive. Uh, not every, uh, most people did not have one, unlike today where most people have three computing devices in their own pockets at any time. Um, but yeah, so, but I was lucky enough. At the time I was still in primary school, but I was lucky enough to attend a school where they actually had computers. And on top of that, we actually had someone there who actually taught us programming. Um, and some of you may, may wonder, why teach programming to a bunch of primary school kids? Well, it was either programming or it was probably Lotus 1, 2, 3 spreadsheets. Now, I don't see what a primary school kid would do with spreadsheets, you know. So, but uh, the teacher there taught us programming uh, using a very, very uh, useful language for teaching programming to kids at the time, which is called Logo. Yeah, some of you may know about Logo. Um, it's something very useful because um, for kids, uh, because you can actually see the results on screen immediately. Um, Logo is basically a drawing program. So you write instructions, uh, the command, the cursor to draw things on screen, so you can see graphical results immediately. I took classes for about three months, 
and then I dropped them, but I never dropped my love for programming and computing in general. Uh, so after that, I just basically continued on my own, uh, continued programming, uh, picking up languages uh, so I can do like C, C++, Pascal, Java, whatever. Uh, and also doing all kinds of uh, programming, so database applications, web applications, you know, uh, 3D graphics applications, whatever. But um, essentially, so I just continued uh, pursuing my interest, which was in programming. But naturally, uh, as, all, as most software guys go through this, naturally at some point, we could become very interested in the hardware as well. So what happens is, for most people, uh, we go out and buy, uh, buy parts, we assemble our own machines, uh, we, we tweak, tweak our bio settings and stuff like that. Uh, we fiddle around, but at some point there's still a physical limitation. There's only so far we can go. Uh, for example, we can't really touch the chips uh, that are, on, uh, that they are in, the, in the computer, for example. So it was just a natural progression, and I, and I decided to further my, in, uh, my knowledge in, uh, and curiosity in these things. So uh, I went to university, I did electronics, and basically just went all the way down to the transistor level. Uh, yeah, so I, I basically went down the entire computing stack from software down to transistors. Yeah. Um, so what's someone with that skill set supposed to do? Uh, I know a bit of software, I know a bit of electronics. So what's the natural thing for me to design? I could design all kinds of things, but uh, to me, it made sense to you know, work on microprocessors, uh, microprocessor design, because it encompasses both electronics as well as uh, software. So the very first microprocessor that I designed was actually the, which is something that I call the K68. Uh, don't ask me why I named it the K68. I don't have a reason for it, uh, but it's obviously just the 68K, you know, backwards. Um, the purpose that, the purpose, uh, sorry, uh, the purpose that I actually designed this microprocessor was to actually figure out how CPUs work, how processors work, or rather what made them tick. I soon realized that the thing that actually made a micro microprocessor tick was the clock, but uh, that's not the real reason for doing it, obviously. I wanted to know how the different functional blocks work um, and you know, how everything worked together. Uh, now, at that time, I had zero idea of uh, how microprocessors work. I did not know anything about computer architecture. The only thing, I, the only thing that I knew about microprocessors was whatever that a software programmer would know about microprocessors. So it was the software view of the uh, processor. But I thought to myself, what the heck? What's the best way to learn? Just do it. Um, so that's what I did. I just plunged in. Uh, I had no idea how uh, CPUs work. I have no idea what computer architecture was. And I just decided to learn and pick it up by doing this project. Uh, I should also just uh, mention that this was an academic project because it was a final year project uh, for my bachelor's degree. Uh, so it took several months. Now, this processor was uh, made to be binary compatible with the Motorola 68K Sys processor. Uh, what does it mean by being binary compatible? Uh, basically, what it means is that it can run, it can read, understand, and execute 68K instructions, although its architecture is totally different from the 68K. Uh, therefore, it's not a plug-in replacement. You can't just take out the 68K and plug in the K68. It wouldn't work. Um, but uh, software that was written for the 68K, you can actually uh, run some of it at least uh, on the K68. Now, why did I pick the Motorola 68K as, uh, in the, uh, as well? I mean, some people would think that as your first attempt in designing a microprocessor, you know, maybe you wanted to start something less ambitious, something smaller, maybe a 4-bit processor or something, or maybe an 8-bit processor. The Motorola 68K is a full 32-bit processor, in case you didn't know. Um, uh, with a lot of advanced features, you could run operating systems and stuff like that, so it was really advanced. Um, so why did I pick the 68K? Uh, the reason was really simple. Uh, it was a processor that I was a little familiar with because uh, it's a common processor that's taught in universities for undergraduate degrees. Yeah, so we did a lot of projects on it, you know, uh, and I understood assembly, and I was familiar with the general architecture of, how this, uh, of the 68K. So it made sense to, you know, as my first attempt, just try and uh, do this. It was either this or the x86. Uh, I looked at, I took a look at the uh, 386 data sheet and I just 
when, who? Okay, forget it. There's just too many things to support, too much backward compatibility, right? So stick to something a bit more simple with an orthogonal instruction set, so 68K it was. Now, what did I manage to achieve after several, working on it for a few months? I was very surprised that it actually worked. Uh, I mean, considering the fact that I didn't know anything about computer architecture at all. Um, it actually worked, but to an extent. It doesn't work completely. Uh, it implements most, I, I mean, I implemented all, most of the 68K instructions and more than half of the, uh, more than half of the addressing modes, but not, not all the instructions are in there. So I had, I had to write some uh, uh, sample applications in assembly, but it worked. Uh, and, it, uh, and I was, I, of course, what did I get out of it? I got my degree. So I graduated, you know, uh, and I also managed to publish a paper on it as well. So that was my first attempt. It sort of worked, but I wasn't really happy with it because it didn't work very well. And in fact, the code was a monstrosity. Uh, the, the process actually ran quite slowly. It only ran at like 20 megahertz which in the year 2002 means uh, pretty much nothing, right? So, but, but it's, it was a good uh, first attempt, I mean, for me. So I went on to uh, think further, and I went on to design my second processor, which was the A18. Again, don't ask me about the name. Um, but the whole objective behind this was to, f I wanted to find a way, I wanted to figure out the technique a process, so it's essentially it's a process for designing microprocessors. Uh, so again, I picked a, a microprocessor that I was familiar with, the microchip pick, which is again another microprocessor that's commonly taught at universities, right? So, uh, and it's simple enough, it's an 8-bit processor, because I wasn't co so concerned with the processor itself, but rather the process, the actual process of designing the processor. I wanted to figure out how to actually do it properly and if possible, to do it fast. So, um, yeah, so I worked on the AE18, and surprisingly, I managed to finish it in about two weeks. Um, and then I knew that, okay, I've actually got the steps down, more or less pat, you know. Um, the earlier design, the K68, took months, whereas the AE18 took only about two weeks. So I sort of have the steps down. And I'm glad to say that this, the steps that I figured out by doing this project are the same steps I still use today. So they sort of work. Um, and just as a result, this processor was also used at uh, North Carolina State University for a student design project. Um, basically, the, professor, uh, the lecturer for the subject just took out certain parts of the processor and got their students to actually implement uh, those parts on their own. So okay, so I've done two processors. Then what next? So next, I went on to design my third processor, which is called the AEMB. The reason for this is because, yes, I've got the 68K clone, I've got the PIC18, uh, but I wanted, I wanted to design a processor that was actually useful, that you could actually run proper operating systems on, that you could actually do something with. So I, just, I, I went around looking for a processor. Now, um, this processor is uh, compatible, binary compatible, the MicroBlaze, uh, if any of you know it, it's the Xilinx Microblaze. It's a 32-bit risk. Um, now, I, unlike the previous two processors, I had no idea how the Microblaze worked. I had never been exposed to the Microblaze. I have, so, so my selection of the Microblaze was not based on familiarity. Now, how did I select the Microblaze? And why did I select it? Um, basically, I looked for, if you noticed, um, all the processors that I've worked on so far are all binary compatible with something else, right? Um, there's a reason for this. Uh, it's because if that processor that I'm working on uh, was binary compatible with another existing processor, there's a lot of existing work that I can tap on. There are two chains for it. There's a, there are C compilers, assemblers, and stuff like that. There are probably even uh, operating systems, libraries, maybe even sample code, lots of sample code available for the processor. So that's what I did. I decided to uh, look for a processor which had a good tool chain. So I looked at GCC, any processor with a GCC, uh, uh, with GCC support, and there were a whole bunch of them, as you probably know. Um, and I filtered it down. So I just went through, went through all, all the microprocessors, looked up their data sheets, had a quick look, a survey, 
and finally settled on something that, was, that I thought was simple enough that I could handle on my own and that was actually useful, that could be used for building real uh, applications. So that's what I did, and I designed A and B. And what did I manage to accomplish? Um, that mentioned there, uh, it's my most successful processor to date. Um, so as people say, third time's a charm, right? Um, it's used in actual commercial, commercial products, so it's actually out there in the market. Um, one, uh, one product that actually uses it is the USRP2, I'm not sure if you know about it. Uh, it's the Universal Software Radio Peripheral, second generation one, they've sold thousands of it. Um, you probably don't know, but the processor in there is actually mine. Right. Um, sorry? Yeah, I use the standard, uh, standard tools for the microblaze, but uh, again, this is not architecturally compatible with the microblaze. Uh, it was different. In fact, it ran a little faster than the actual microblaze. Very little, very slightly, but it, uh, five megahertz faster if I, can't, if I don't if I remember it correctly. But yeah, so it was my most successful microprocessor to date. Um, and it was also uh, benchmarked as a very, very small and very, very fast uh, open source microprocessor by a researcher at TU Delft, which is, I believe, in the Netherlands. Um, uh, this is a, just a screenshot from the master's thesis, so one of the charts. As you can see, the AMB is at the lower right corner. So it's really small and it's really fast. Um, now, some of, some of you may know chip design, some of you don't, but if, for, for most people who learn chip design in school, we are all taught about the speed and size trade-off, where basically, if the, the basic concept is, if you want your chip to run fast, the size of the chip will generally get bigger. If you want your chip to be small, the size of the chip will, uh, sorry, the speed of the chip will actually slow down. So there's this trade-off, this curve. This curve is true, it exists, and there's a reason for it, physical rules, okay? But what most uh, schools don't teach us is that you can actually move the curve up and down, depending on how you do your design. So another accomplishment for this microprocessor was that I spent a lot of time hand-optimizing it, okay? Hand-optimizing it to squeeze the maximum performance out of it, so that's why it, it's actually really, really small, uh, and really, really fast. Now, uh, it's also got to, like I said, I wanted to design it as a useful processor, so it's actually got some usefulness to it. Um, on the left side, you see tech, uh, cross technology. Um, basically, I designed this processor so that it can be implemented in various technologies. Uh, most designs that you find out there are usually they are target specific, in the sense that they are optimized for sp certain uh, target technology. But in my case, I tried to make it, make, make it generic. So uh, it, I, it's known to work in Xilinx platforms, on uh, Altera FPGAs, uh, and it's also known to have uh, successfully synthesized for UMC.13 and 0.18 uh, ASIC process. Um, and on the right side, uh, you see operating systems. It's known to boot free RTOS, uh, which is uh, like the world's most popular RTOS, uh, open source RTOS. It's known to boot Muse Linux. Uh, it's also known to boot uh, Micro COS2, which is another very popular uh, RTOS. Uh, it boots OpenWRT as well as other software as well. Now, these are, like I mentioned, that is known usefulness. Why? Because this processor was actually at one point, at one time, the second most popular open source microprocessor on open cores. Um, it beat out a lot of other processors, uh, except for the open risk. Um, so, that had, that there's been a lot of people who've actually downloaded this processor by open source. I have no idea what they use it for. It's up to them what they want to use it for. Uh, the only time I find, find out about this, the only way for me to find out about these things is if they actually contact me, uh, email me, uh, and let me know what they're using it for. But otherwise, I have no idea what they're using it for, uh, how, it work, uh, how it's working for them, and stuff like that. But yeah, so this is, these are the things that I know of, things that I know of, because uh, they've contacted me in one way or another. But yeah, so that's, uh, that's uh, my third processor. Um, but I didn't stop there either. So I went on to design another processor this year, the DCPU16. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard about this processor. Do you guys know the game Minecraft? Minecraft, yeah. So Marcus Pearson, right? 
Yeah, so he, he's currently working on a new game. It's called OX10C. It's like a space exploration combat kind of game. Yeah, and in that game, he actually designed this virtual microprocessor called the DCPU16, which is used to power starships. So the idea is that the, the gamer can actually write software for the starship that he's uh, you know, controlling in the game. So when I first heard about it, I thought to myself, wow, this is a processor that powers starships, right? So it's, uh, it just totally excited me, and I thought to myself, I've got to make a, you know, a physical implementation of this. So I actually did it. Uh, I, I looked at uh, the design, and I actually implemented it. And this is the one that I did within a week. So I'll talk about this uh, a bit later. But yeah, but the final result is, um, of course, I'm still waiting for starships to get invented. Maybe one day when uh, Marcus Pearson, uh, you know, they'll actually build a real starship and they'll actually implement this, but I don't know. Yeah, so that's uh, the most recent processor that I've worked on. And there's another one that I'm working on as well. Now this is, uh, this is something I'm gonna release early next year, so it's coming soon. Uh, it's, uh, it's basically gonna be a, a, a processor that I'm thinking of uh, running for various applications. So it will be able to run multiple threads in hardware. It will be one-threaded, dual-threaded, and quad-threaded. Um, and yeah, it will be coming out soon. Again, don't ask me about the name. Okay. But yeah, so those are all the microprocessors that I've been working on, uh, on my own. Now, back to some theory. Um, in real-world microprocessor design, what does it actually involve? Um, it involves quite a number of different things. Um, firstly, it involves, obviously, chip design, lots of chip design. So what does it mean uh, when we talk about chip design? Um, I'll just briefly bring you through the steps. Um, we start at the top with architectural specifications. So basically what that means is uh, you get a bunch of people, you sit them, down, or sit, this, uh, sit them down, and you work out what does this process actually need. What are the functional blocks that it needs? Does it need a multiplier? Does it need a floating point unit? Does it need uh, certain other features? Whatever, right? So that's architectural specification at the top. Once we've figured that out, figured that out, we move on to the next step, which is basically design entry. Now, this is what this means is basically uh, we actually implement the design. We actually, sorry, we actually do the design work. So in the past, this was done using schematics. So people actually uh, come, draw schematics of transistors, wire them up, you know, and um, that, that's how it was done in the past. Now in the past it was okay, like in the uh, days of the uh, 68K, you only had like 68,000 transistors in a processor, so uh, it's something manageable. But in today's world, we've got like billions of transistors inside a microprocessor, so it's not feasible anymore to do it by schematics. So today, what we normally use is what we call HDLs, or Hardware Description Languages. Now, if you were to look at HDL, it looks very much like software programming code, um, but it's not. It's actually a language to describe hardware, not software. It's a replacement for schematics, so that's what I always tell people, uh, that it's, it, although it looks like software code, it's not software code. And if somebody treats it like software code and it write the hardware code like they were writing software code, number one, it probably wouldn't work. Uh, and even if it did work, it would probably wouldn't work very well. Yeah. But uh, that's generally it. So nowadays, what we do is we actually code. We actually write the description for the actual uh, chips that we're designing. And then the next step is uh, synthesis. Now this can be analogized to um, compilation for software. So in software, we have, like say, C code. We put it through a compiler, we compile it. Out comes the binary, so the binary block, which is the executable. Um, for chip design, we do a similar thing. We take the HDL code, we synthesize it, and out comes the circuit. So that's essentially, that's that synthesis. Now, once that is done, we usually bring it through place and route. Now, what does place and route do? Um, it literally places the individual uh, circuit elements on, on say, the silicon, uh, and then it actually wires them up. So that's where the routing comes in. It wires them up as well. And then finally, we verify the entire thing. We check to make sure that it's, uh, you know, we do a bunch of different checks. 
to make sure that uh, they will work. And then we tape out. Tape out basically means that we send it to the fab and they make the chip for us, the physical chip. So these are the, some of the things that uh, a typical microprocessor designer would need to know, you know, chip design stuff. Now besides that, the typical microprocessor designer would also need to know about computer architecture, obviously. So I'm not going to go through all of the details of it, but uh, at the very least, um, they would need to know the general architecture, uh, whether it's a sys, whether it's a RIS. Uh, this is important uh, because we need to select the right pipeline for it. Um, but yeah, so whether or not it needs certain uh, features, whether it needs FPU, ALU, uh, stuff like that. Uh, whether or not it's single instruction, single data, that means it's a single processor running a single instruction stream, working on a single data stream, or whether it's, say, a super multi-core, multi-threaded uh, device that runs multiple instruction streams uh, on multiple data streams. And also how it accesses memory, whether it has a shared memory space, or whether it's separate memory space and stuff like that. So the designer will also need to have some familiarity with uh, computer architecture, not just uh, chip design. Besides that, uh, it's also very useful to know software programming if you want to be a uh, microprocessor designer. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've actually got to write libraries as well, drivers if necessary, so we've got to know some software programming. But more importantly, understanding how the processor is actually going to be used is actually very useful if we want to optimize the processor. Because uh, if we know how it's commonly used, we can always focus our attention on those, uh, those features that are necessary. So software programming comes in really, really handy. So like in my case, I, I came from the software direction. So I knew software programming first and then went downwards. So uh, it obviously uh, it helps a lot. But just looking at this, you sort of get the idea that, okay, we've got to have a bunch of people, a huge team to do these things. Uh, you've got to have guys who can do you know, uh, chip design, you've got to have people to do uh, processor architecture, you've got to have people to do software. And this is actually quite true. If you were to go to, say, Intel, or if you say if you were to go to you know, ARM, AMD, or whatever, you've actually find hundreds, uh, 100 or more uh, engineers who are actually dedicated to the microprocessor design teams. Um, so, next question that comes in, it comes in is, how do we do it alone, on our own? So it's a one-man army, basically, right? Um, yeah. So that's the first question. How do we do it on our own? Um, if we were to talk about chip design, microprocessor design specifically, what comes into most people's minds is something like that, which is what we call the application-specific uh, integrated circuit, or an ASIC. Uh, people think about this, you know, like uh, you've got a silicon wafer, you've got chips manufactured on it, and then you get a bunch of chips at the end. Um, this is, there's nothing wrong with this. This is a perfectly valid way of designing microprocessors. It's just extremely expensive. Um, I'm not sure if you know this, but the software license alone for chip design software that's used, could easily, easily start. It starts at like several hundred thousand euros and could easily hit millions. That's just for the software alone. And we're not even talking about the actual manufacturing process yet, which will cost lots more than that, a lot more than that. So this is not something cheap. If we were Tony Stark, it wouldn't be a problem. Uh, we, could, we could splash you know, easily 100 million or something on designing our own microprocessor, but we're not. So how would we do it alone uh, and with, within a certain budget? Now, thankfully comes along a device called the Field Programmable Gate Array, which is an FPG, what, what we call an FPGA. Now, what's an FPGA? Um, that's the Wikipedia uh, definition for it. But essentially, you imagine a chip a device which has a whole bunch of gates in it, a whole bunch of gates. Now this device is a programmable device, so we can actually program this device, but we're not programming software, we're not writing code, um, not writing instructions. What we are basically doing is we are, going to, we are going to program the wiring for the device. So it's essentially having like a whole shelf full of 740 parts or something, and we can pick and choose our parts, 
put them on the board, do the various wiring manually. So it's basically the same thing, but this is at a chip level. So it's a silicon device, a semiconductor device, small little device with lots of gates in it, lots of devices in there that we can actually wire up. So this basically helps us uh, to do chip design uh, on the cheap. Um, FPGA boards come, I mean entry level FPGA boards probably cost around, around the region of say 100 US dollars. So it's not terribly expensive, it's affordable. Um, and yeah, we can design, use it for all kinds of applications, not just microprocessor design. But yeah, so that's basically the way that I do microprocessor design. It's all based on FPGAs, um, not physically wiring things up, unlike some projects that you find on the net. Um, uh, so this is wiring things within the chip. But yeah, so now that we've got an FPGA, um, how do we actually go about? So how do we actually go about designing a microprocessor? Now, I've got a highlight here first, a disclaimer. This is my technique. It works for me. It may or may not work for you. Your mileage may vary, right? But this is what I do. So the first thing I do is basically architectural specification. Yeah, so I, I look at a processor that I want to design, and I do this literally with a pen and paper. I don't touch the computer at all. I use a pen and paper. Um, I start drawing blocks. Okay, I've got a, I've, I, I want to have this FPU. I want to have this ALU. It's got to have these features, right? I start drawing blocks. And sometimes I go all the way down. It actually helps if you can go all the way down to the uh, logic primitives. So essentially, you go all the way down to uh, the flip-flops, uh, the logic gates, and stuff like that. So that's, that's the way I do it. The reason is because um, it's actually very helpful to have a good idea of how the, heart, the electronic circuit looks like before you actually do anything else, uh, which is the next step, which is actually uh, writing HDL, coding. Uh, like I mentioned to you earlier, um, HDLs are replacements for schematics. So it's, it would be very useful if we actually had an idea of how the schematic looks like. And when we write our HDL, when I write my HDL, I basically describe that schematic in, uh, in code. So HDL, there are lots of, uh, lots of them out there, different languages out there. Uh, the most uh, popular two are VHDL as well as VHDL as well as Verilog. Um, personally, I prefer Verilog uh, only because it's closer to the hardware. Uh, so one is less likely to make, mis make uh, the mistake of writing it like as though it was software. Whereas VHDL is a little bit, uh, it works at a slightly higher level of abstraction, so it looks a bit more like software. Um, and you can write stuff like as though you were writing software, uh, which will result in uh, basically very bad designs. But yeah, so the next thing that I do is basically sit down and write the HDL, right? Now after I've written all the HDL, the very next thing is to basically test it. So simulate it. Now, writing the HDL, what kind of tools do you actually need? Basically just a text editor. Any text editor will do. Okay, uh, um, whatever that you, uh, that you prefer, right? Emacs, VI or whatever. But yeah, that's all you need. Now for simulation, there are also lots of uh, open source uh, simulators out there. Um, since I like coding in Verilog, I like writing Verilog, uh, my favorite, uh, favorite simulator is Icarus Verilog. Uh, it's part of the GDA uh, suite of uh, open source uh, electronic design automation tools. Um, yeah, so I like using uh, uh, Icarus Verilog. So how do we simulate it? We simulate it by writing a test bench. And what's a test bench? It's basically more HDL code, but a HDL code that's specific to testing the design rather than uh, functionally uh, specifying the design. So that's what I do. And I do simulation and testing. Once that is done, I bring it through synthesis. Now, uh, which basically, like I mentioned earlier, synthesis will take the HDL code and generate the circuits. Now, in order to do this, uh, uh, to target, say, for FPGAs, uh, since we're targeting FPGAs, um, the synthesis tools are usually free, given freely. You can download it from the, uh, uh, the vendor of the FPGA. So uh, Xilinx has ISC tools, uh, Qu uh, Altera has Quartus. Uh, 
Right? We can just download it, pop our HDL in, run the synthesis process, and out comes a bitstream that we can then use to program the FPGA. So that leads, so finally we can implement it. So this is basically all the equipment that I need. Uh, a computer, a uh, FPGA board, and that's it. And yeah, so it's not that expensive, something that uh, someone can do alone, uh, and it's affordable. Um, the desktop fan at the back is optional. Uh, it's, it's not meant for cooling the FPGA, it's meant for cooling the designer. When you live in a country where it's 30 degrees all year round, you know, you need a desktop fan in case the air conditioning fails. But yeah, but that's basically, and this is a real implementation. Um, yeah. So now I'm gonna talk about the actual example of designing a processor within a week. Now, uh, the example I'm gonna use is the design of the DCPU 16. So I'm gonna bring you through basically uh, step by step how you actually do it. So the first step, day zero, studying documentation. Uh, for a lot of engineers, this is something that we don't like. We don't like reading stuff. We don't like reading data sheets, you know, stuff like that. But uh, it's very, very critical. If you want to design a microprocessor, you've got to understand, um, if, especially if you're gonna clone an existing one, or some, one that's uh, binary compatible with an existing processor, you've got to totally understand it, uh, how it works, what instruction it supports, what, uh, what functionality it has, and stuff like that. So study, there's a lot of studying involved, reading, 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 reading. And I highlighted a last bit there, which is sample software, because um, some people might miss that out. Um, it's very important to read uh, sample software as well that's been written for, if you have, if for example, you're cloning an existing processor, right? Um, sample software that's been written for it, uh, simply because it, it'll actually help you to optimize the processor better. Yeah, if we know how it's used. So that's, uh, that's the first step, day one. Now reading is not just for the sake of reading. While we are reading, this is what we'll need to do. We need to actually uh, figure out instruction families. Now every processor has a bunch of different instructions. They've got like hundreds of instructions in them, but we just sort them out. We sort them out into families. So like uh, arithmetic instructions all go into one column, uh, logic instructions all go into another column and stuff like that. So we sort them out. There's a reason for, there is a reason for doing this, um, but yeah. So while we are reading through the documentation, very important step, sort out the instruction set. Now once that's done, on the second day, day two or day one, um, we've got to figure out the pipeline. Now, what's the pipeline? Um, a pipeline is basically a sequence of steps that a processor takes to execute any single instruction. So for every processor out there, there's a different pipeline for it. But yeah, so we got, we've got to sit down and figure out the pipeline. This is a very, very critical stage, uh, critical step actually. Um, but yeah, so for example, that's a classic RISC pipeline that I'm showing there. Uh, it's a five-stage RISC, RISC pipeline. It has instruction fetch, decode, execute, memory access, and write back. It's a very, very typical uh, classic RISC pipeline. Um, so take the example of, say, an addition. Let's say we were to add the number one and two, output should be three. So what happens is in the first stage, the processor will fetch the instruction from memory. So add one and two, that'll be the instruction that comes in to the processor. Now in the second stage, the processor will decode that instruction. So that processor reads that instruction and figures out that, okay, I'm supposed to add one and two together. Then in the third stage, which is the execution stage, it actually performs the addition. But the results aren't ready yet. Uh, the results are only written out in the last stage, which is the write back stage. So the output three is only produced uh, at the write back stage. But yeah, so that's a pipeline. And like I said, this is a very, very critical step in designing any processor. Uh, if we get this wrong, the processor will never work. Okay. So, uh, but if we get this right, everything else will just fall into place. So that's how we know if it's right. If everything seems to fall nicely into place, chances are you're right, we've got it right. If things don't quite fall into place, then maybe it's not quite right yet. 
But yeah, so what I normally do is I would actually start with a, one of the classic pipelines, this classic risk pipelines, there's also classic sys pipeline, classic pipelines for various uh, architectures. So I'll usually start with a, one of the classic pipelines and see if all the instruction families work. So that's, where, that's why it's important to actually sort out the instructions. So I have to, I've got to check to see if it can perf the pipeline that I've chosen can perform an addition. Now, if it can perform an addition properly, it should be able to perform a subtraction, multiplication, division properly as well. Um, can it do like a shift, a left shift? It can, if it can do it properly, then it should be able to do a right shift as well. Things like that. So that's what I do. So I figure out the pipeline and, uh, and, look to, uh, and check to see that, that it can, the pipeline that I've chosen can actually execute all different instructions in that microprocessor. Now, um, sometimes all, the, all we need is the classic pipelines, but sometimes we need to add a little bit more, make modifications to them, but yeah, that's uh, what we'll need to do. But basically, we start with the classic ones and modify them if necessary. So for the DCPU 16, this is what I ended up with. It's an yeah, eight-stage pipeline. Uh, if you look at it, it looks very similar to a classic sys pipeline with two additional stages. Um, but that's just because the processor was written, uh, the processor specification works that way. Um, so it's got an eight-stage pipeline. So each instruction takes eight clock cycles to complete. However, I layered them over uh, one over the other, overlapped them. Uh, so instructions are executed in two state, uh, two phases. So the effective cycle for a single instruction becomes four clock cycles instead of eight. But yeah, so that's what uh, I ended up with the DCPU 16 on the second day. Now on the third day, I actually, this is when I actually start doing the actual HDL coding. So I, I always start with the register file. Uh, what's the register file? It's where all the registers are kept, the main registers of the processor uh, that are used for computation. So I always start with the register file, why? because it's the easiest part to design. It's the core of the processor, it's also the easiest part to design. And it's just a good way of you know, giving myself a pat on the back, saying that, okay, I've actually started doing uh, some coding. So just to give you an idea of how easy it is to design, this is the actual uh, register file for DCPU 16. The, interest, the, the, the important parts are only this bit, this bits here. So it's about, what, six, seven, eight, eight lines. That's basically the important part. That tells the, the tool that this is going to be a register file, which is implemented as a dual port memory. But the, the rest of it is basically comments and uh, input output specifications and stuff like that. But uh, essentially, it's just that. So it's not a lot of code. So it's obviously something that it's manageable. One person can do it. No, you don't need an army to write seven lines. Yeah, so that's what I usually start with, which is the register file. Mm -hmm. Oops. Okay, so once I've got the register file done, um, then I basically move through the pipeline step by step. So I start designing the memory interface because the first thing that we've got to do is figure out how to fetch instructions and also fetch data. So the DCPU 16, I ended up with, uh, uh, using two buses for it, which I call the F and G bus. No reason why it's called F and G. Um, yeah, but it's used for fetching instructions. It's used for reading operands, writing operands, as well as doing uh, effective address calculations. Now, the code for this is a little bit more complex, um, but it's still manageable. It's a bit more complex, it's a bit longer, but most of it's uh, dealing with the effective address calculation um, and as well as the bus protocol. Now, what's the bus protocol? Sorry about this. Um, yeah, so what's the bus protocol? A bus protocol is basically the set of rules that are used for the processor to talk to external memory or devices. 
So for most open source processors, we like to use the wishbone bus protocol. Um, the reason is simply because uh, it's an open spec. Uh, we can just download it and use it. Don't have to pay any royalties. But there are lots of bus protocols out there that we can actually use. But yeah, so most of the code that you actually saw is actually dealing with the bus protocol. So this is an example of a transaction. So if, whether it's reading stuff from memory or writing stuff from memory, there are certain rules. Certain signals have to be asserted and de-asserted at certain times. So that's a bus protocol. So uh, that's designed in as well in day two. And then on day three, what do we actually do next? So now we've got a processor that has a register file and it has the ability to read instructions from memory, fetch instructions from memory. It also has the ability to load operands from memory, write operands into memory. So the next thing that needs to be done is basically to implement the actual operations of data. So again, this is where the list of instructions, uh, that, uh, the sorted out list of instructions that we had earlier will come in handy. So we can just figure out what uh, instructions need to be implemented. And these are the instructions in the DCPU 16 that are actually implemented. The only ones that are not implemented are the division and the modulo instruction. So those have been grayed out. Uh, but everything else is implemented in the DCPU 16 implementation. So you can execute all sorts of, uh, all the operations except division and modulo division. But yeah, so that's done in day three. Now what do we do in day four and day five then? Um, essentially, uh, we deal with hazards. Um, so that's basically got to do with branching. Uh, if, you, if you do uh, programming, you know that software jumps around. Uh, it branches to subroutines and stuff like that. So we insert in the branching code, uh, as well as handle any necessary data forwarding problems. Um, but besides that, uh, on, the la uh, on the fifth day, it's basically optimization and cleanup. So we go through the code, and we clean up the code, remove redundant stuff and uh, things like that. And in terms of optimization, that's what I usually like to do. I like to make it small and make it fast. Um, so that's usually done right towards the end. Um, so by this point, we actually have a working processor. We have a machine that has the ability to fetch instructions from memory, uh, load operands from memory, perform operations on them, as well as uh, save the results back into memory. It also has the ability to jump around, branch here and there. So um, yeah, so that's a complete processor. Can do everything. And yeah, so on the last day, this is what we do. We release. So we upload the source code. Yeah, so it's available on GitHub if you want to look at it. But yeah, so that's basically it. Thank you very much. So, are there questions? Uh, yes. Um, do you also use uh, specific FPGA features like hardware multipliers and that kind of stuff in your code? Uh, yes. Actually, I would do that at that step. Architectural specification. Um, when I sit down to try and figure out what are the features that this processor needs, I also look at the FPGA primitives to see what is available. Because, uh, for example, like you mentioned hardware multipliers, uh, if there is a hardware multiplier available, then, uh, and the processor needs a multiplier, then obviously we've got to implement a multiplier. Um, if, the if the FPGA doesn't have a mul hardware multiplier, then we might have to design our own multiplier, right? So, yeah, so that's basically done at the very first stage where we actually look at architectural specifications. Yeah. Um, the uh, your, uh, the processor that was most successful uh, was that FPGA only as well? Uh, FPGA, uh, the processor that was most successful, the AMB. Yeah. Yeah, it's only been implemented in FPGAs so far, but both uh, Xilinx as well as Altera ones. And just uh, another. Do you do you have any? Uh, are those the actual? Are those actually your drawings? The picture? Uh, no, uh, image source. These oh, are okay. just stock images. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, what sort of things do you look for, and what do you do? <laughs> 
Sorry? Uh, what sort of things do you look for and what do you do to reduce the size of your design? Okay. What kind of things do I look for and what do I do to reduce the size of my designs? Now, there are many optimization techniques out there. Now, there's one, I'll just highlight one here since I have an image of it. This is a simulation of the DCPU 16. Okay, if you notice there, there are lots of red, red marks there. Those are actually faults. Faults. Uh, I purposely introduce faults into my design in order to optimize it. It, it works. It works that way. Um, if, we, if we try to uh, make the pr processor work correctly all the time, it would take a lot of extra circuitry. So I try to introduce faults when it is not essential for it to work correctly at that point. And by doing that, I actually optimize the processor. So, yeah. And of course, I look at, uh, I try to, f and, and what, what else do I look for? The other thing that I looked for, like I mentioned earlier, was to look at how the software actually uses the processor. So certain sequence of instructions, for example, may never, ever exist, may never, never, ever happen. So you can just, you know, do some stuff to the uh, design and just uh, reduce that. The code or the CPUs you make are strictly synchronous. They have a central clock, or do you have things that are self-timing or? Purely synchronous designs yeah, at the moment. And the yeah. tools are also made for that. You cannot make other things with, which don't have a central clock, or is that, would it be possible to do um, that? For the synthesis tools, it's definitely possible uh, to use them to design asynchronous circuits. Uh, but generally, the technique that, uh, that I use is basically synchronous. But of course, there's plenty of work being done today uh, in asynchronous microprocessors as well. So you are using the standard cells from the FPGA vendors, or are you using uh, own code for the logic parts under the, under the uh, Layout. Um, okay, so as far as I can, I will use the primitives that are available in the FPGA as far as I can. Um, simply because it's just more optimized, it's faster, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, But if necessary, then yeah, we'll have to design it ourselves. But so far, most of it, I just use the primitives. Are there more questions? Please raise your hands so we see you. Yeah, in the beginning you talked a little bit about actually synthesizing to real, uh, to uh, completely to tape out, uh, and you mentioned also mentioned the cost involved uh, with uh, while well, licensing the software or for those tools. Uh, do you know a little bit more about uh, how why those t tools are so expensive? Or is there not enough competition or order effects maybe? Um, first, I have to say that this is my personal opinion, okay? So I don't get into trouble for this. But yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a combination of all the things you've said. Um, number one, there's of course a limited number of vendors. I mean, the major ones are Cadence, Synopsis, Mentor, and they've pretty much cornered the entire market on it. Um, and the funny thing is, um, uh, you can't just buy one set of tools. So you can't, for example, just go to Synopsys and say, okay, I want to buy all your Synopsys tools. Um, chances are you would also need to buy like Mentor tools and as well as Cadence tools as well. Uh, depending on the fabric, the, the, the manufacturer or the fab that you actually work with, uh, they often use different tools for different stages of the design. So you end up having to buy a whole bunch of them. Yeah, uh, so yeah, so one of the reasons is obviously uh, there's only like three, three major vendors for this, yeah. But the other reason that I think it's uh, probably the, mo the more compelling reason is if you can't afford to spend a few million bucks on the software, you can't afford to do tape out because the cost of tape out is a lot more than just, you know, the software. The software is an insignificant, you know, or not so significant uh, amount. Okay, so there is nobody else raising his hands. Thank you for your presentation.
Thank you very much. Next, in like 50 minutes, will be Jan Guidon. Guidon? Guido? Guido, sorry. Um, he will show us how you uh, can simulate your own homebrew 1632 bit free architecture uh, using a browser. And we will have some live demonstration here too, as well. And now we'll have a break of 50 minutes. So, enjoy. <laughs> <laughs>